Hey there everybody, it's Nathan Cool, and in this episode I want to show and review a low cost yet high quality alternative to getting into mirrorless cameras doing real estate photography. Now as you know DSLRs are harder to come by, there's a lot of advantages to using mirrorless, but a lot of this can be cost prohibitive. And in my realm as you know, although I recommend Canon, Sony, a whole bunch of other type of cameras, I am a Nikon shooter. And so I've got a whole closet full of Nikon glass. So one of the options here is a hybrid, but you can buy this every piece of this hybrid right now, brand new or used. I'm going to have links to all the gear down in the description for this video. I'm going to be referring to some other videos on my channel so I don't have to dig in too deep and waste much of your time with this episode. So those links will also be in the description as well as my books on real estate photography. And I'll be referring to a few sections in there as well. But this is definitely a low barrier to entry to get into real estate photography if you're just starting out. It is one of my recommended setups. So that's why I wanted to put this entirely through the test from top to bottom, really run this through the whole gamut of doing real estate photography, especially interiors, using flash with it, all the different things that'll come out of this because some of the advantages of using mirrorless can work against you with using real estate photography setups like this. So I want to cover all those with the settings, the hardware, everything that was involved with it. So without further ado, let's get into this. The first few items that really makes a good decision on getting this to begin with before we get into all the idiosyncrasies review and the setup for this, first thing right off the bat is price. So you know that since the pandemic, a lot of things are on back order. It's hard to get a lot of uh, cameras. And I used to buy a lot of refurbished DSLRs for just hundreds of dollars and that were full frame, 24 megapixels like the D610, D750. Those are really hard to come by. So what you've got is a lot of mirrorless stuff that's in stock. And this really isn't that bad. This happens to be a Z5, but you can also be using a Z6, a Z62, a Z7, but the Z5, I picked for a lot of reasons, and it's not just the cost. The cost for this, for the Z5 body, comes in at about $1,300. It's not bad for a brand new full frame camera, about 24 megapixels. As far as its quality, really, quite honestly, between it and a D750 and a D610, D850, all those other cameras, you're not really going to find that much difference in the final image quality doing real estate photography, but there are some advantages that can actually get you through a shoot faster, and I'm going to be covering some of those. But to make this this work with a wider choice of lenses, I am using the FTZ2 adapter and that's right in between here. Now the reason for that is that there's not that many lenses available yet for Z cameras. Canon has the same problem as well. Sony's the only real mirrorless out there that has a whole lot of lenses, although you can get into you know Fuji and Olympus, they've got their own brands. But talking just about the big three as I usually do of Nikon, uh, Canon, and Sony, Nikon and Canon really haven't caught up to Sony when it comes to a lot of lenses, but the FTZ adapter allows me to use a closet of F glass that I can use the old DSLR lenses. So I have a few of these Takina 16 to 28 F2.8 lenses. You know, they're one of my favorites. I can pick one up for $600 brand new. F2.8 lens, fantastic. If you go to my portfolio on my website, NathanCoolPhoto.com, all those interior photos were taken with that lens. So it is good high quality lens, but adapting it requires that FTZ2 adapter, which costs 250 bucks. So we're talking about $1,300 for the body, 250 bucks for the FTZ2 adapter, and then $600 for the uh, lens for the Takina. But when we're talking about just getting a lens, if you were to go pure Nikon, if you wanted to get an F2.8, their 14 to 2400 lens, it's about the same price of this entire setup just for one lens. Now that's the 14 to 24 f2.8, about $2,400. If you go for the 14 to 30 f4, which is their budget lens, and a lot of real estate photographers go that route, it's $1,300. Some of the things that I'm going to be talking about with autofocus and quality, all that, you're not going to find that much difference, I'll tell you, with the 14 to 30 f4. So if you don't have any lenses yet, if you're starting out, that may be an option to go toward. But if you already have some Nikon f glass, or you're thinking about just a budget, you can use this FTZ2 adapter and a whole array of lenses. Every, almost every lens that was made for a Nikon DSLR for all these decades past can be used then 
on this camera. So that was a big one. Another big thing though, for me using any type of camera for my professional work, it has to have dual card slots so that one of them runs as a backup at all time. Now, you know, I use a Z6 for doing my real estate videos and that uses a XQD card and it only has one card in it. So there's no backup. Now for video, I don't mind that because Nikon DSLRs also didn't backup video on the fly, like on the D610, D750, they didn't do that. So having the dual card slots doing photos is a must for me. And that's one of the things that the Z5 has. It has dual SD card slots, and that's hard to find in the Nikon line. It's a very a good thing to have. And for only a $1,300 camera body to have that, you can't even find it that cheap when you're going toward the Canon route in the R line. There is though, Sony the a7 III does have dual card slots. That's becoming now an older camera though. So for a brand new Nikon, right out of the box, Z5, dual card slots, $1,300, really great bargain. One of the most important features of why I recommend this particular setup, something you can get at a high enough cost buying these um, the, the Z glass, with the Takina Opera, the Takina 16-28 f2.8, and a lot of the older uh, F-mount lenses for Nikon, you get the distance window. This is something that just doesn't come with a lot of the less expensive glass on the Z-line, for instance, the 1430 f4. It just doesn't come there. And so the problem that you have with this is if you're trying to really focus, you can see that's really searching for a focus. If you think you're locked in on focus, you might not be. And this is a problem that I'm going to get to on some of the focus, but you can see it's still searching here. That wheel is moving around. So it's like, am I really at focus when I decide to press the shutter? This is at 1.1 time and it may be someplace else the next time. So it's always good to know, am I really at that right distance? So whether you use focus peaking, whether you rely on whatever type of focus mode inside the camera on these mirrorless bodies, you still can't be 100% sure all the time unless you have a focus distance window. So it's a very simple thing that has been on lenses since the beginning of time. But now with these Z mount lenses, they're relying so so much on just, well, just let the body figure it all for you. you. You won't have to worry about it, but you will find that you will find inconsistency sometimes, especially when you're shooting a lot of frames, doing a lot of composite work, putting that together. So I'm going to get talking more about focus, focus modes and all that and what I recommend in just a second. So before getting into the focus, this is how things would look using the electronic viewfinder on the back screen. And there's an advantage here when you're doing real estate photography using the flambient technique, and that's that you can watch the histogram on the back, and that's just a matter of changing how you want your display. But one of those display modes has that histogram, and you can be just changing your shutter speed and watching the histogram move along the way to see if you're underexposed or overexposed. So you could be right about there, that's exposing to the right, and take a picture with uh, finding a good focus point on there, and boom. Now we want to go to our flash shot, so we'd uh, turn on our flashes, and we'd want to see though, are we exposing properly? So the same thing here, we can see, well, are we, you know, knocking out enough of the ambient artifacts before we take our flash shot, and then we can fire that off. Same thing with doing window pulls, however you want to, you can uh, modify the view here, you can see what's really happening in real time, instead of the old way, like with DSLRs, taking a picture, seeing what it looks like on the histogram, seeing if that would be satisfactory. So that can really help out saving time. You basically just need to take one ambient shot for your flambient, then you'll know exactly when you go to doing your flash shots and window pulls, what shutter speed or other exposure settings you should be at. Now there is something very important to note here, is that if you are able to do this, to be able to do this and modify this, if you have a trigger in the hot shoe, like the uh, Godox X Pro, which I've got actually mounted in here to control the flash, you need to make sure that you're following the same type of instructions that I provide on avoiding the auto white balance issue, which is you have to have center pin isolation. So you need to be using something that won't be talking uh, smarts intelligence down to the camera from the uh, hot shoe trigger. So what that does is not, not just affecting white balance, but it affects other things as well. In this case, it's telling the camera that I've got a flash. It's not going to look the way that you think because
because the flash is turned on, so this isn't gonna be accurate. I'll just show you my idea of the view. So what I do, just like on the uh, with the DSLRs to avoid the auto white balance issue with these type of triggers, is using a Nikon camera, I use a Canon trigger. So Nikon camera, X Pro C is what I'm using there. That would also be the same if you're using the flash point, you want the Canon version of it or some other type of center pin isolation. Once again, links to that video that discusses that issue with the alternatives and parts you can then use to uh, make sure that this works. But if you are using a Nikon smart trigger in the hot shoe, you will not be able to then change on the fly your exposure settings and watch the histogram change as well. So speaking of white balance, it is a lot more complex and somewhat convoluted for doing real estate photography using a Nikon Z camera and the neat, the Z5 is no exception to that. There are just so many options. I've tested them. I'll give you my recommendation here. Just to give you a quick rundown though, is that if you were to choose auto, there are three different types. And of course you can access this from the uh, I menu too as you're shooting a lot quicker than going in. But this gives you a good idea of what there is, uh, zero, one, and two. And you'll hear all kinds of blogs and videos and tell you how one is better than the other, but there's really nothing there for doing flash uh, interior real estate photography. And none of these work very well with that and do not work consistently. I know this not just from my experience, but also working with some other photographers that were having similar problems using the Z6 and the Z7, Z6 II and whatnot. So the Z5, no exception to that. I do not recommend any of these particular ones for flash photography. If you're doing HDR, if you were just to be doing ambient, then I would recommend auto zero. That's gonna reduce a lot of the warmth out of it and retain a cooler color. And it does very good on just ambient shots, but of course I do flambient, so I don't care about the ambient shots. I care about my flash shots. So the one that I found to work the best was natural light auto. And this did a fantastic job. Now Nikon says that this is really for dealing with natural light. And the range of this would be anywhere from 4,500 to 8,000 Kelvin, but that's not true. That's in the documentation, in the fine print, they always say those are approximations. And what that is, is just something that they expect where natural light would vary, you know, off of about 5,000 Kelvin daylight. But it's not. I've shot interiors with flash and it's auto detected down to 3900 Kelvin. And of course, as you know, uh, the auto white balance, it'll vary. Your white balance will vary anywhere from 3500 to 5500 Kelvin inside based off of all kinds of casts, light sources, and the introduction, of course, then of flash into that. So anyways, my recommendation for white balance on the Nikon Z5, save yourself a lot of hassle. If you're doing flash photography, if you're doing flambient, set your auto white balance to natural light auto. Now, autofocus has been a point of contention on a lot of these Z cameras, and on the Z5 especially, there has been a firmware update, and that's what's in this camera, and they've done a great job with it, but it still isn't quite perfect. So right now, if you go to the autofocus modes, I've got AFS selected, and that's just our single server uh, servo. So it, it works pretty good. You don't want continuous. You can try manual, but of course, relying on autofocus is, is quite convenient. Convenient. Now, most of the time, if you go up here to the AF area mode, uh, single point autofocus tends to work fairly well, but not all the time. Sometimes because of the size of the square of that, it will overlap other areas. Right now I've got it over here on those doorknobs, and that's that would focus fairly well. And I can then uh, verify that on the distance window that's on the lens, so another reason why I like that distance window. But as soon as you get into some areas that may have some type of bright contrasty light, it might struggle and it's hitting, you can see there's low light, it's trying to kick in the low light help to see what's going on there. And that still wasn't too bad, um, but it doesn't always work that well. So you could try that, and if you're struggling getting autofocus, then another option is to go into your settings, go to that AF area mode, and then select pinpoint autofocus. Now this will give you a much smaller little red dot, probably hard to see with this uh, capture that I'm doing off the back screen here, but you can get very close. Now what will happen though, you'll hear it's really struggling. So if I listen to the lens, 
you can hear that motor just going back and forth because it's doing a lot of verification to make sure that it's hitting that little pinpoint area of focus. So if you do use pinpoint, you'll tend to be far more accurate, but it will take longer and there'll be a lot more searching with your lens to do it. But once again, either way that you use with either pinpoint or just that single point typical autofocus, then as long as you've got the distance window, you can verify that that's good. No matter what though, one of the best ways to do focusing for real estate photography using one of these newer mirrorless cameras, whether it's the Nikon Z5, whether you're using Sony, Canon, doesn't matter, they all have something known as back button focus. And this is a great option where we're used to pressing the shutter halfway or you're pressing your uh, sh shutter release halfway and you would do some focusing. But what I've done here instead is I've used the AF on button, which is on the back of the Z5, and I'm using this as back button focus. What this allows me to do then is to set my focus using the AF on button. It figures out where it is, and then once that's done, I can just start taking pictures. I don't have to let it focus every time. So as you're walking around doing composites, you're doing flash, your focus is set once. You do have to remember though, it's that, okay, I have to find my focus point and set that, and of course you can verify that on the focus distance window of the lens. Once you're happy with that, then you just start firing. You do that whole series of shots that you would do. So to set that, let's take a look at that real quick. All you need to do, it's very simple. You go into the menu, we went into the menu, and you go to the custom settings menu, and you want to go to A, which is autofocus. When you select that, there's a bunch of different options and you want to select A7. That's what it is on the Z5. It might be different in uh, future videos here as they add more stuff for other cameras, but it should be A7 across the board. It's known as AF activation. When you go in there, a lot of times it's default to that shutter AF on. What that means is when you press the shutter halfway, it does the autofocus. You want AF on only. And by doing that then, it sets the AF on button on the back of the camera to be what's used then for focus. So once you've set that inside the menu, then it's very simple. You just doing the, the shutter button halfway doesn't do anything. It would take a picture if you were to do this manually. But all you need to do now is when you focus, you'd find your focus point, go wherever you'd want. You'd hold in that AF on button until you get a green square. And then once you do and you verify that on your focus distance window, you're happy with it, you just start taking pictures. You can be walking around doing your composite, doing your flash shots, doing your window pulls, shower pops, whatever it is. The camera doesn't have to focus each time and every single frame will have the exact same focus. The one thing that always has bugged me though about most of these mirrorless cameras, uh, especially I see it on the Z5, is the responsiveness. If I want to sp spin my thumb wheel, I'm not getting real time necessarily changes down here. Sometimes there's a little bit of a lag. There was one. If I go down here, if I try to go up real, f boom, it just lagged on me again. So it's like it's not exactly real time. So if you're used to shooting real fast and you're going, oh, I need to get that window pull. Let me just get up here to 160. Oh, you just went up to 250th of a second because you went too far. But as long as you're not really spinning your dials too much on the camera, then you really won't fall, uh, see much of a problem with that. But that is just one annoying thing that is a little bit hard to get used to. Another thing though that I really did like about this setup, whether you're using the FTZ adapter or not, that's this ring that's right in here, the lens starts right here, body's there, is that the sensor really doesn't, it's much easier to clean. It doesn't really get as dirty. For one, not having the mirror, obviously we're not throwing dust all over the place every time we uh, need to take a picture, but also there's less chance for oil to be spread all over the place too. You know, that was a big problem with just about any DSLR, not just the, uh, the Nikon line either. So that does make it easier. One thing though is that if you are gonna be using an FTZ2 adapter, which by the way, I don't recommend the FTZ, I do recommend the FTZ2 because the FTZ has a strange foot on the bottom and you can't really even hardly find them anymore. Um, but the FTZ2 adapter is that 
it's another link in the chain that can cause some dust to get inside of it. So you gotta make sure that your lens and your FTZ2 adapter are clean before really putting them on the camera. But if they're not, not that big of a deal. When I was taking lenses on and off this setup and I got a whole bunch of dust in there, I spent no time at all to get it back out. It was very, very easy to keep this very clean. The other thing too that might be a concern is you're thinking, well, this is a pretty heavy lens. This is about a two pound lens on here. It's about 950 grams. So you think that, you know, here we've got this, you know, tiny little body of the Z5. Then we've got this ring on top of here for the FTZ2 adapter. And then we've got this lens on here. Well, you'd think that would start getting top heavy and start bending. So the FTZ2 might be tempting because it's got a little foot connector on the bottom. I don't recommend that though. You don't need it. These bodies, and the FTZ uh, adapter are made out of that uh, magnesium alloy. They're very strong. It's rated at lenses up to 1,500 grams, I believe it is, 1,300 grams. Maybe it's, yeah, about 1,300 grams. But the lens, either way, it's only 950 grams. It's well below that uh, 1,300 gram mark. So it's not heavy enough to really be of a concern for that. And of course, bigger lenses will tend to have anyways a, uh, a tripod foot on there, which you would mount it on. One little annoying thing that really bugged the heck out of me was this stupid hanging cover here. So to get to the cables, I'm just gonna unplug. This is the shutter release cable that I've got in here. Let's put that off to the side. So normally the camera has this connected in here and it's covering up your uh, HDMI and your uh, port for the uh, shutter release. So to get to it, you have to pull this up and yeah, it can bend and stay in place, but I found that it just wants to pop out. So I could lift this up. I could put this in here and that would work fine covering it up, but after a while it tends to pop out. So I just left it popped out, but it is designed to be able to hold that in place, just being bent up at a 90 degree angle. But if you do need to get into using some of the other ports, for instance, HDMI using some other USB or something like that, this thing has to just hang off the side. So in the older uh, Nikon DSLRs, they had a door and the door would just turn to the side, which is good. Instead of these things, that just kind of have to flip up. Same way if you're trying to use a mic. You've got this thing here. You got to kind of get it, move it out of the way. You just got this mess. It just doesn't look all that professional, but it works. It's a small knit, not that big of a deal. Another little nit just to be aware of is that if you do want to use the FTZ2 adapter and you're using the Benro or similar geared head, you want to make sure that you can see that bubble level. I've turned the camera sideways here so you can see it. But if you were using the FTZ2 adapter, instead of having your mount here, your mount would be farther over this way. So that means the camera would be moved back and it would cover up that bubble level. Another reason why I recommend using the FTZ2, not the FTZ adapter. Last but not least, there's a very important issue regarding using Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. And that's that these products are making assumptions that Nikon Z cameras have baked into their RAW files, their own camera profiles that have already taken care of vignette and distortion control, which are options in the menus. Turn those off in your camera. That's what I recommend doing. And then this is a very simple alternative to make sure that you are using this correctly with the non-Z glass. So if we go in here and I were to apply a, a typical pre-processing preset like like I show in the books, it would be doing a profile correction. You can see over here, I'll do this manually. So if I select do profile corrections and I say enable profile corrections, it's going to say that it doesn't know. It says down here, unable to locate a matching profile automatically. You may get a different warning saying that it's built in. If it says built in, that means that you have something set for uh, some type of vignette control or you have that set for doing the distortion correction. Those are off, so it doesn't even know what to do. Even though in the EXIF file, it shows that it's using a Takina 16 to 28. It's because of the combination of Z body to lens with Adobe getting confused on not knowing that it can make a combination of a third party lens. 
So all that you need to do is you still enable profile corrections and go down here to lens profile and I'm using the Takina. So I just scroll down here and I will select Takina and sure enough, it knew automatically to use the ATX 16-28 F2.8. Knew right off the bat to use that. And you can see then without that, it had distortion and vignetting and that was all corrected just like we would expect. Then what you do is once you have this all set up, just make yourself a preset up here and Lightroom and create a new preset with that information. So what I have here, when I select a, uh, a picture here that was way overexposed and I was testing this out. So uh, here, this hasn't had anything applied yet. And I've got one I call it Takina 16 to 28 FTZ. And I just press that and then it does everything else that I recommend for the pre-processing presets. And then you can just copy paste just like you normally would. So anyways, just a very simple intermediate step to make sure that you select the lens pro profile the very first time using one of those images, one of those raw files in Lightroom, make a preset, and then you'll never have to do that again. So overall, this is really a good investment. It is one of my recommendations if you're on a budget and if you're looking to get into using this for real estate photography, you don't have a lot of clients that you're not all that busy, this is a very good alternative. If you're looking to really up your game, you might consider something along the lines of the Z6 II, Z7, if you're going the Nikon route. But nowadays, as I've talked about in other videos, brands don't really mean anything anymore. They almost all have the same quality. There's very little difference. So whatever brand you prefer, then of course that's the one that you want to go with. Anyways, I hope this video was helpful. I hope that you really enjoyed it and that you can apply some of this to your photography as well. If you did like this video and you want to see more, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It won't cost anything. And as soon as one of these videos is posted, you'll be the first to know. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, take care, be safe, and get out there and shoot something.